All right. I think uh, today's presentation is mostly focused around, around air around airby. What is it? Why is it needed? And uh, give you a little bit more familiarity into internals of Airbyte. And I did some work to develop a custom connector offline. And I'll just show you a very simple uh, connector that uh, you know connects uh, one source to a destination. Uh, let's see how much we can cover and, uh, and how much time we have, uh, Piyush. Is it? We have 45 minutes. I think that is plenty. Okay, let's, let's get started. Um, I think this is the template. All of you know these etiquettes. I'll skip this. Um, I'll start with, uh, you know, this is the agenda. I'll start with data mesh. What is it? Uh, why is there so much buzz about it? And then I'll jump into how modern data stack contributes to this uh, data mesh architecture. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we'll look at uh, the transformations part of the modern data stack. Um, and then we'll dive into how Airbyte enables transformations and then we'll do a demo. Um, most of you probably already understand. Uh, you must have read tons of blogs around this. So the idea here is when we have a large corporations with several departments and functions and teams working on building data lakes, I think the first generation of data lakes ended up being a big mess. Um, one mm -hmm. classic example is I think Royal Caribbean, I remember, you know, who are, uh, it, it's not derogatory, it is just that Royal was uh, trying these things way ahead of rest of the industry. So they were uh, using Neo4j as their data lake and they started ingesting data from various data sources. Uh, very soon it got very confusing. There was tons of data uh, that is acquired, stored in they knew for J, but uh, you know they didn't quite understand how to get meaningful information out of it. That's because when you ingest multiple data sources, the burden is on the consumer to understand what this data is about and make sense and write here his own transformations for his own purpose, you know, be it a BI report or some kind of AI project. Uh, that led to a, and, and then on top of it, they did not want to allow other teams to access this data uh, because, you know, some of it is confidential, so they just couldn't open it up for everybody. Uh, that led to another confusion, uh, you know, people asking for, do you have this data? Yeah, I do have, but I can't share. I don't know how to share, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then I think, you know, recently uh, somebody came up with this idea. Hey, you know, we are building these data lakes. Uh, we are uh, trying to sink in a whole bunch of data. Why don't we replicate the domain-driven design successful architecture that we are implementing in microservices for data lakes as well. And there uh, the bond, bond the idea of data mesh. The idea here is the infrastructure can belong to an enterprise team, but the data should belong to the respective domains. That's it. I think that is as simple as it is. So instead of building a swamp, where you just sink in any data anybody wants and expect consumers to fish what they want. You let the teams own their data, but you control how they implement the technicalities, the infrastructure using a centralized data team. I think that made a lot of things simpler and easier. Now, each team can have their own domain defined and then they become the owners of the domain and they are responsible for acquiring, curating, storing 
and they are responsible for sharing uh, and 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 they do that easily and quickly i apologize let me mute this they do it quickly because there is a centralized infrastructure team in place you know who could enable them with all the basic pieces of technology already figured and all you need to do is just leverage that infrastructure and just quickly build your uh, you know domains or data ponds or whatever whatever you call it so that's the idea uh, so ram this uh, basic pieces of infrastructure does that also include uh, the kind of uh, uh, technology choices or like the tooling choices like uh, are we are we going to be putting that data on say something like where do you want me to put my data as a domain subdomain do you want me to put it on snowflake do you want me to put it on s3 is there something is this a decision that then the infra team takes and i'm just responsible for curating and managing my data absolutely absolutely i think i think uh, it is best so so why would a team need a different technology if the evolution of technology has to happen that should be coming in from an enterprise data engineering team so the data infra engineers are responsible for adopting new technologies and individual team should not be making the technology de decisions i think you know classic example is heb right each team is reinventing the wheel some goes for gitlab some goes for uh, azure some goes for aws and then it becomes absolutely difficult for one domain to talk to the other domain because end of the day these domains need to interact with each other uh, i'll get into the details of uh, dbt maybe that's a separate session but if i am a domain i need data from another domain and that's sitting in aws versus some other technology how am i going to easily integrate that so to your question because i think it is very important that the technology should be consistent centrally managed whereas the data is managed by individual teams hmm. okay and the and the etl tools or elt tools that i'll be using for curating my data that is going to be my subdomain choice or is that where the infra team also comes in the technology the infrastructure is central it should be driven by uh, a central team okay if i am developing a particular schema i think we will see that in uh, airbyte as well which is an elt tool uh, you can have your own schemas for your data you can have your own bigquery or uh, snowflake or databricks uh, schemas uh, but but the tool has to be you know ideally tool should be common across all okay so ram that was my question right uh, so if the i do control my data and then i have my own schema then do i need to maintain another schema for this data uh, infra team or who will maintain that schema uh, for the cross functional data transfer suppose uh, you are a finance domain your mm -hmm. schemas are owned by you mm -hmm. so say for example you are using google platform so google has data catalog mm -hmm. and and obviously you can organize depending on you know how you how you organize uh, your teams you know some some cases um i think let me take the example of vertex ai right like the feature stores so the finance can have their own feature stores or uh, supply chain can have their own feature stores but all of them are on google vertex ai so the technology underlying is same but okay. the schemas and data definitions are definitely owned by the respective domain teams so the definition of a customer let's say customer domain the definition of a customer in the customer domain is owned by the uh, that particular team now i am in the let's say purchasing domain and i need to use a customer object um i can ideally i should rely on the customer object from that domain okay and if i need to add additional 
um, like you know elements, then I will be able to customize that to my need and and define an extended object on top of uh, the 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 customer uh, domains customer object, and that can be enabled very easily if you are using let's say a common um, you know tool like dbt and bigquery for example yeah uh, uh, ram just curious uh, i know that uh, so every subdomain uh, to piyush's point as well every subdomain may not be using say uh, the google uh, data structure or uh, you know like somebody might be using oracle i am on a i am on a, a sales system i might be using sap hybris i don't know you know like there there could be various variations uh, uh, what i think is that the data product uh, that this subdomain is responsible for generating uh, that is something that should be standard so that we can use it across uh, different so every every subdomain produces their data product uh, which is going to be on a standardized uh, structure and a standardized platform so that it can be uh, merged and reused across the organization exactly correct correct now now i think there might be for example if you have legacy systems let's say a mainframe or an oracle erp or some crm um i think the domain driven approach helps in identifying you know who is the owner uh i should say for example if i'm in finance domain i should not be extracting the customers from my erp i should be relying on customer uh, uh customer uh, domain take the customer domains object and then customize it to my needs instead of i writing my own elt pipelines going to erps and saps and oracles in fact that is to their advantage because all that preliminary work is already done and you have readily consumable object in the customer domain data lake all you need to do is you know minor modifications in your dbt and deploy and you are ready to go so i i, I have a question so because they're domain specific the data if for instance a, a legal team like this happens a lot in fintech and banks uh need to access uh, basically financial records they have to go then to the financial team to give them the records because they can't access the data themselves i i presume because it's domain specific they actually have to go talk to the domain to get this data before they can use it correct correct i think and and that is the right way josh because because if you think of it how do you how do you so so this data is getting stored in some kind of cam common data lake technology you know be it bigquery or snowflake or whatever it's very easy to open up access to anybody else i mean you know i'm quite familiar with gcp and uh, all you need to do is you know give certain permissions on the service account mm -hmm. and you will be able to access the data but but is it safe to just you know throw it in a data lake and let everybody access it you know in in particularly in healthcare domain it's uh, it's very, they have to be extremely careful to be hipa hipa compliant not to open up you know uh, say for example a patient's deceased data to all the domains mm -hmm. so they need to mask the data for certain domains and unmask the data for certain other domains so those kind of things can be implemented if it is done right using domain driven design so the so the legal teams can go to the respective domain um and and giving access to domain is particularly very simple because you are on the common platform mm -hmm. so figure out who owns whether whether this is another common challenge in large corporations i think if you are implementing data lakes you will already realize uh there is data but should i give access who 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 says yes to giving access to certain piece of data to certain individual or certain team so that kind of data governance 
is very hard to maintain unless something like this is uh, clearly defined. Now, finance team has a business um, leadership that can take these calls very quickly. Okay, you know, I'm going to allow my you know finance data to you know this particular team, um, you know, because they need it and they they are allowed uh, you know with this kind of access. Actually, the data privacy is one of the biggest uh, gainer in this kind of architecture. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because otherwise you have to basically make up lots of code or other difficult to keep track of standards and blocks. Meanwhile, if it's just a separate organization, then there's more clear cut line, which, yeah, that makes sense. Exactly, exactly. and. And you don't have to worry about accidentally exposing some patient's data or customer's uh, birth date. Um, in, let's say, for example, if, uh, if you are in marketing domain, right, like accidentally exposing some data to some social platforms. I mean, that's scary. And, and definitely this will, will not only help opening the data quickly, but also closing the data for uh, uh, you know, right parties. Uh, it's uh, no, now that it makes sense. Now the big challenge is how do you create this platform? Um, I think I should put that in the slideshow. How do you create this platform? Right. The fundamental building block is ELT data pipelines. I think you know. All of us who have worked on data engagements know how much time we spend in writing the pipeline code. Um, you know, companies like HEB, Cogniras, you know, write uh, like you know, complete uh, spaghetti pipeline code, uh, which is very hard to maintain, very hard to evolve, and more importantly, very hard to extend. Um, so the modern data stack solves this with tools like Airbyte, Fivetron, Meltano. There are a bunch of nice ELT tools uh, that can be um, that can that has plugin architecture. I'll get into the details. The second, obviously, you know, you need some sort of uh, cloud-based data lake storage. Um, and I think in modern data stack, all three major ones like Snowflake, Databricks, and BigQuery support this. Uh, of course, you know, uh, Snowflake started this revolution. BigQuery is the uh, very similar product uh, that does exactly the same thing. Databricks has been working very hard to convert their Spark platform to more like SQL driven, you know, come closer and closer to Snowflake. But you know, they're they're definitely um, a little behind uh, Snowflake and BigQuery. Third is uh, data transformation. Uh, just like we discussed, if one domain has certain data, the other domain needs it in a different format. I should be able to build on top of the work that you already did. And I'll uh, show you what I mean by data transformations. Um, and lastly, modern BI tools. Um, I think uh, Looker and few new BI tools fall into that category. The old BI tools like Microsoft BI, they are uh, fast evolving. Uh, the key thing here is, model driven development you know I'll, I'll, uh, I'll again you know once you understand data transformation like dbt you would appreciate why it is so important for bi tools as well now um i think you know this is, this is kind of pictorial view you might have seen this uh, you know multiple times um, so what I just talked about, a good ELT tool with plugin architecture where you don't have to write point-to-point -point interfaces. You can rely on a common tool like Airbyte, Meltano, Fivetrans uh, type, type uh, pattern. Mm -hmm. The second is, uh, you know, the, the lake house or data lake. 
uh, Snowflake and Databricks and you know BigQuery. Uh, the third is uh, DBT. Uh, that's the transformations that can be implemented on top of the SQLized uh, data lakes. And lastly, um, a modern BI tool like Looker. So uh, the transformations, you know, the, the pipeline code, I think uh, the first generation of implementations relied heavily on Spark and and particularly particularly the map since it evolved from map reduce um the data frames made the task of data conversion you know fairly simple uh, i think uh, you know those of you who worked on pig scripts and uh, even before writing uh, uh, you know, mappers and reducers and implementing it on Hadoop, you know how painful that used to be. Uh, 2015 Spark came into the picture and it dramatically changed by implementing, uh, I think earlier version had so-called data sets um, and it leveraged the power of uh, Scala and functional programming to make data transformations easy and parallel. And uh, I think uh, around version 2.0, SQL came into the scenario. Exactly at the same time, Snowflake uh, is born. And Snowflake uh, implemented the exactly same thing, hiding all the pipeline code away and opening SQL because SQL is the dominant language and, and there is a lot of skill set already available. And, you know, that has changed the game for Snowflake and suddenly, you know, uh, it, it has become tool of choice for uh, implementing data lakes. I think this is an example, like, you know, you write the same code with a lot of database connections and, you know, you would, uh, you would do transformations and joins and whatnot, uh, versus, you know, you can achieve the same thing with, uh, you know, this SQL that is at the bottom of the screen. Now, agreed, the SQLs based transformations tend to create SQLs which are uh, very complex and writing those SQLs is not for the faint hearted. You know, you need hardcore, uh, you know, years of database experience to, to write these SQLs. But luckily for most companies that exist already, I mean, most of the developers from the old generation are extremely comfor comfortable writing these complex SQLs. So it nicely tied into Snowflake and, and you know, the same thing works for, uh, work, works for uh, BigQuery as well. Today, I'm not going to go into the detail of uh, database uh, DBT. Uh, I think uh, we'll do another session. Uh, but broadly, uh, you know, this is what uh, DBT does for you. Uh, basically, dbt, you can think of it as uh, the git for SQLs. So you can define your models and then you can keep extending and create this kind of DAG similar to what you do in Spark or Beam or whatever, uh, except each of these models are essentially SQL statements. And these SQL statements can be stored, exposed uh, to multiple teams, stored in git, and executed using dbt. You can write a whole bunch of unit tests and data quality tests. So it becomes extremely easy to write your CI CD pipeline to test for conditions of like, you know, bad quality data coming in, again using SQLs, and then raise alarm if you feel your input data is being corrupted. You know, which was a big missing piece in a lot of uh, data lake i mean you know who is who is uh, uh, i mean a lot of companies started writing pipeline code to you know check for uh, data quality but dbt just makes it nice and easy and all in one particular project and uh, around the data quality validations are these like uh, assertion checks or what kind of checks are these exactly asser assertion checks like you can uh, you can say things like you know this column need to be unique 
this yeah. should not have more than these many nulls um okay and is there a, is there a way of checkpointing as well so i remember for one of the pipelines that we were doing for one of our other clients uh, uh so we wanted to make sure that the amount of data say if i'm getting 100 records in the start the transformation happens and then i end up with you know, like uh, 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 maybe 80 so we wanted a checkpoint on the numbers as well uh, that okay 20 records are bad and 80 are going ahead and then out of these 80 this is how the rest get transformed so what they were really interested in is that you know like we want to make sure that we are not leaking any data and uh, wherever there is a data variation we need to identify that this is what happened uh, so uh, is that also something that we can do with dbt absolutely absolutely i think you know those kind of tests will become extremely easy for you to implement and easy for you to schedule periodically so okay. all, all you do is something like you know dbt run and give a specific set of tests and it will run those and it will give you the result and you can trigger some kind of alert saying that you know this has happened and force somebody to uh, you know take necessary action okay essentially essentially dbt puts uh, the power of sql um, you know to do pretty much uh, pretty much anything okay. Now, coming back to Airbyte, I think, you know, one, one of the critical piece in this uh, puzzle is, okay, you know, I'm in a large enterprise. There are multiple legacy systems and sources and APIs. I need to continuously expand my sources of data. Uh, <laughs> and I should be able to do this without a lot of uh, custom connectors and coding. Uh, you know that that's where uh, you know it, i think five so so meltano is built by gitlab it is uh, not so mature but it has a nice architecture airbyte is relatively mature pipetron is the commercial version it's cloud based i think a lot of customers have been using pipetron uh, but any other tool of course, you know, there are some strong points and weak points, uh, but all of them have predefined custom plugins slash connectors that connect into uh, pretty much everything that you can think of. Like, you know, from Facebook social data to Salesforce CRM APIs to, uh, you know, like your Postgres or Oracle or uh, you name it, you can read data from any source and write data to few destinations you know primarily because this is meant for uh you know data implementations the destinations tend to be much smaller so the number of sources for airbyte is over 300 plus and the number of destinations are around 13. Um, those 13 include obviously bigquery databricks snowflake um and then you know all the popular databases like oracle um postgres and mysql uh, so on and so forth i i think uh, redshift and you know those kind of things uh so if you want to acquire data and store in your uh, data lake uh you know most of the time it's uh, just uh, click 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 and you would see the data um I'll, I'll i'll do a demo and and you will understand what i mean by that mm -hmm. um so that's uh, that's the beauty of airbyte uh if you look at airbyte internals so at second wave we implemented airbyte in kubernetes so it's a nice way to horizontally scale um so airbyte has this uh uh, primary components are, uh, there is a web app server, which provides all the UI, which ties into um, a server uh, pod that implements uh, all the APIs. Uh, so the web app talks to the server. And there is a scheduler, which is, which is maintained by Temporal. Uh, Temporal is an open source project. Uh, one 
I think, you know, I won't go into the details, but one, uh, one nice thing about Temporal is uh, it sits really well with Kubernetes. Um, so the Temporal service, which is, which is written in Java, it leverages Kubernetes Java SDK to spin off pods, to spin off pods directly from Temporal service. So, so what happens is you issue an API call from your UI and the server uh, relays that to the, uh, the temporal service, which will spawn workers on demand who actually does the job of reading the data and writing the data. Uh, let's say, for example, you know, you are reading from Postgres and writing to BigQuery. Um, so you define a connection using the web app uh, server like UI and that configuration gets stored in uh, Airbyte's own backend storage, which can be Postgres or Cloud SQL or whatever storage you want. And then you can schedule um, to run that particular connection, let's say every 24 hours. So that gets stored in Postgres as well, our backend database, which talks to the temporal service. Uh, again, you know, these pods need to be always up, the temporal, the web app server, the server. Um, and the temporal service can start a worker to read data from Postgres. Uh, and it reads the data as a stream. And then it will spawn another, it can spawn another worker or pod to store that back into some kind of destination like BigQuery. Uh, and those configurations are stored in Postgres as well. So it is, its state is always, pre, always preserved. So let's say the read succeeds and write fails and you restart it. Uh, and that state is stored, so it exactly knows where it left off, and then it will it will execute uh, the destination um, uh, task as well. And the transformation logic that is written as a part of the part of the worker, is it? That transformation logic can also be, in fact, uh, Airbyte allows DBT integration. You can write so once you read, you can implement the whole. Um, you know, domain transformations within DBT and Airbyte will read those. It will accomplish all of them in the worker and streams those records back into the BigQuery. Yep. So is there a control over the worker code? Like you can use your custom workers? Um, the worker itself is a standard Airbyte implementation. I don't think you need to implement your own worker. You know, Airbyte <coughs> will take care of it. All you need to do to develop this, um, you know, connector or plugin is to, it's like, you know, Java interface implementation, right? There are like, I'll, I'll show you, I'll come to that. Uh, yeah, yeah, sir. But you don't need to implement your own worker implementation. Uh, of course you can, you, you know, Airbyte is open source. Uh, if you feel, if you I think most teams never have to implement, but uh, I mean, I can't think of a situation uh, where you need to implement your own worker. The yeah, same thing, like if you want to integrate DBT or any kind of a transformation tool in between while reading and writing to the destination. So DBT already is integrated, so you don't have to worry about that. <coughs> And what is the, uh, Ram, I'm just trying to draw parallels with Akka because you know, like that is something that I know more. Uh, so uh, this worker, uh, what is the, what is the uh, amount of threads that he'll be able to use? What is the, uh, what is the, are, are, are we going to be able to put a cap on say the RAM usage or the CPU usage of this worker? How does it, how does it assess and access the, resources that it will need uh, per worker. So, so workers in Airbyte are more of infrastructure, Airbyte infrastructure. Uh, 
okay that, that is not meant to be controlled or opened by the developers of integration but uh, you can control see no, this whole airbyte can be implemented in kubernetes so if if you want to control the memory and cpu consumption by these okay. workers okay you would do that in kubernetes okay but okay. it's not a airbyte configuration that you would control um you know the uh you know the the creation of the worker or uh, destruction of the worker okay okay and uh, the number of workers is that something that we'll specify or that will also something that the temporal service would decide you can specify you you okay. can say i want to keep uh, four workers online because you know i'm doing a lot of activity um you you can control okay so okay. so it is it is ram like uh, related to spark workers right when we when we spin up, spin up an emr cluster on aws so we can just specify like okay these are the spark workers that i would need and if required i can give their configuration but then the spark take care of everything the spark master take care of everything yeah it's very similar very very similar but but remember mm -hmm. each worker is handling you know could handle multiple connections or connectors and and temporal in fact uses the worker to spawn pods yes to do multiple things within the uh, connector like for example each connector has to do certain sequence of steps like for example it has to read mm. um it has to transform and it has to write so those three pods will be spawned from the worker and of course you know you need more workers if you are processing more data um and and obviously like in that case you want to spawn more workers usually yeah i mean you know i i don't know what's the capacity of one worker um but uh, in second wave uh, we were pretty decent like one worker could manage more than i think 10 or 15 connections at the same time mm -hmm. okay. so uh, if we draw an analogy with uh, the kubernetes uh, terminologies right and these workers a pod or a deployment i mean is it a pod or a deployment infrastructure wise or if we don't have any control over this like vikas's questions was like uh, can we configure like yeah yeah you can you can definitely configure it's a deployment okay uh, it's a deployment yeah yeah these are uh, open source uh, customized uh, manifests um you know because it's open source we actually did a lot of customization on on these uh, and it's fairly you know easy and simple in fact uh, we did so there is a lot of apis that workers implement um you can actually you know just read the source code and start tinkering with uh, worker configurations and how they connect and uh what kind of <coughs> pods uh, they spin off etc okay uh, ram quick time check uh, we have less than 5 minutes you yeah. have this so let's uh, let's get into the demo um so uh what i did was uh, i mean you know once you get the source code there is a docker compose i can just spin it off on my local um and then it starts on port 8000 and basically you know here is how airbyte interface looks like uh the open source doesn't come with any default authentication um one way is uh, um you know what we did uh, in google gke is um identity aware proxy um you know to open the url uh, but if you need further authentic authentication and you know ldap integration then you will need to go for uh, the commercial version mm -hmm. i think there is some open source effort going on to add authentications but right now at the moment it is not available um so essentially uh, these are the three main things right it's as simple as 
you know you need uh, to define your sources you need to define your destinations a connection is nothing but connecting a source to a destination and schedule it so if you yeah. take this and the transformation run uh, like if if we have to write some transformation logic that uh, can be done uh, unfortunately this connector default connector that i wrote it uh, doesn't allow oh okay okay but uh, i think I'll, i'll try to create one database uh destination then probably it will open up the transformations as well okay so this one this one is loading data from the source and pushing it to the destination correct yeah you know this one i just created it reads from a public url a csv file okay. and writes into s3 so right. file to file so uh you know it doesn't need any transformation so i didn't implement yeah so how about the schema i just preserve the schema of the source i'll i'll show you that so okay. if you look at the code uh so this is how the code looks like um to develop i think we are jumping into custom connector development uh before i jump in yeah sir you know remind me uh, i'll show you how to handle the schemas um so so basically how do you define your sources and destinations so every source and destination is essentially a docker image so what you do is um if you look at all your sources so these are all publicly available existing sources that comes automatically with um you know uh, deploying your airbyte so all these sources that you are seeing like all these crazy zoom and zendesk and what not are all um you know publicly available docker images with their own versions mm-hmm. and they keep uh, upgrading them and all you need to do is like you know just upgrade uh it just downloads the latest docker image into your implement your uh, airbyte implementation and these two are uh, custom like for example in this one the custom connector source that i define this is my own image so it's as simple as that so this plugin you write a piece of uh, python or go or uh, java code you package it uh, you implement certain interface and you upload that you know convert that into a docker image upload that and then you define a new connector and then you can give some connector name give uh, whatever uh, docker image name and tag and give the documentation url that's it and that will create a connector plugin in airbyte once the connector plugin is created now you can use that to create the new source now you have the docker image let's say uh, it, it is asking for you know what kind of source right in this case uh, i mean i have my custom source or mm-hmm. i can just go and pick whatever like you know from s3 now once i define s3 it will throw a menu and it will ask for a bunch of uh, hmm. that you need to read and these are defined in the uh, in the code in the in the code you would define a spec uh that spec will have uh, you you can define what you want to acquire uh for running your connector and once that spec is created um you know let me let me create one sample how do i back out scar so let me create a new source i'll pick mine so i need only one which is where do i read it from uh if i say um i mean this will fail but it has to give some kind of csv file but uh, some you know sample.csv right now if i hit source what it does is it first checks the connection let me hit, hit it and okay 
I think uh, I didn't do any checks. So it let me go ahead with that mm -hmm. because, because I think uh, I'm probably hard coding. So basically, whenever I create a new one, it does this, it, it runs this code. Um, in this case, I'm just, uh, you know, returning succeeded. I should actually, you know, do some checks and then fail it. But in this case, it created. Now, so a source is defined. I think I should have named it different. So every time you press uh, save, what it does is it invokes uh, the check uh, part of the code and verifies and then comes back. Uh, so that's how you define. Uh, basically, you dockerize your code, upload, define uh, the source definition in the settings, and then create the source using that source definition. Now, you have a destination, then like, for example, in this case, I can go and create a connection, new connection. I pick uh, this and I can pick whatever is the destination. Oh, sorry. Use the existing source. And then I pick the destination. I only have two destinations. And the moment I use existing destination. Now it's doing some basic checks. And here is where it will throw you a whole bunch of options if they are available. Uh, like, for example, if there is a schema implemented, then it will, like, for example, if you are reading from a database table and you defined uh, your uh, JDBC URL and authenticate, then it will throw you a bunch of tables here. And it will tell you, like, are you going to fully <coughs> overwrite or append or change data capture? Mm -hmm. And then if you want to do change data capture, what is your cursory field? And what is your primary key? Um, and, uh, you know, so, and then here is where you can also define your transformations. Uh, you know, if the transformation is enabled, you can say, here is where my DBT code a repository is, uh, in which case it will go pull that uh, transformations and execute that transformation after the source data has been read. And then output is what is what it is going to send to your destination. Uh, I think if I set up connection, it might try to It should all fields are okay. I need to give it some name. Right. And now it tries to sync. I'm assuming it will fail because the URL that we gave is a bad URL. Okay. There it is failed. So it tried to get some data, and I think, uh, um, you know, th that didn't work as expected. So that's kind of, obviously, it is trying multiple times. Um, and I'm going to disable it. By the way, everything that I did now can all be done using Postman APIs. Airbyte automatically exposes the APIs. So, you know, obviously, you don't want to let people create these uh, connections um, all the time. Then, then it will become like, like chaos and somebody is deleting somebody else's. Um, Airbyte also implements spaces. Of course, you know, you can, like, for example, as you can see here, this one is implementing a particular workspace. You can create multiple workspaces. So there is a nice uh, segregation of domains. Like, for example, for finance domain, you can give a workspace and they can define their own connectors and extract the data. Or you can, you can implement a Git project you know, convert all of what we did into API calls and then implement 
execute APIs using a deployment script or Airflow or whatever you want. So that's kind of a, a user interface. Now let's get into the code a little bit before uh, we finish. So uh, the process to create a custom plugin, I mean, if you don't find the plugin that you want among those 300, which is very rare, um, you know, it happens, you know, sometimes the custom connector may not have certain nuances that your project needs then you can take the open source code and then tweak it, which is what we did for second wave. Or uh, you can write a completely new custom connector. Uh, what you do is uh, you get your Git code and there is, um, there is a script. So this is the open source project and you can go to Airbyte integrations folder. And there is a script called generate. There is a script. Uh... Okay. Okay, I don't know where it is, but anyway. So there is a simple shell script that they have given. All you need to do is execute that and it will create all this structure for you. And then all you need to do, so the step <coughs> one is, um, step one is spec, which is, you know, what do you want to accept as an input? Uh, once uh, you define your spec, like you can, you can add all your properties. I want to read URL, I want to read this, I want to read, um, you know, the service account key file or whatever. Once you define that, then you go to source.py. Now this is a sample Python uh, implementation, right? Like uh, you can get, obviously, when you, when you do production grade, you want to make sure, you know, you don't code everything here, you have your classes and you know well modularized uh, so you all you need to do is you need to implement three methods first is check the ch all, all check should do is it should verify connecting to the source of your interest mm -hmm. so if you are connecting to postgres make sure you accept the credentials you test connection to the database and give the feedback whether it is succeeded or failed. That's all. The second is uh, discover. This is where the schema comes into the picture. Say, for example, in our case, it is file. So you are reading a file and writing the file and you don't care about the schema. So it just uh, replicates. But let's say you are reading from a database and writing to BigQuery. This is where you could define, you, you should define your schema. Uh, right now, I just kind of hard coded and, and not using it, but, but you can have your own logic. You, you know, obviously you won't hard code this way. Um, you know, like for example, if you are reading, let's say a specific type of database, you connect to the table, you can run a SQL query in the uh, metadata tables, get the schema of the particular table and convert that into an Airbyte valid schema. And that Airbyte valid schema would look something like this. You know, it's, it's fairly self-explanatory. Do you allow nulls and what kind of data type it is and what is the field name? Uh, once you, so this, this one, just uh, get this schema in this JSON format and convert that into Airbyte catalog object. And if you return this, now this method will be used as uh, a way to discover the schema of this source, which can be used uh, for transformations. Um, yeah, 
you know, basically for transformations. So in, in case of database, say for example, you are reading and it does not agree with this uh, schema, it would, uh, it would fail. So that's the second one. And the last one is actual read process. You know, this is where you would connect with the database since it is already checked. It will read the data in whatever format. You would format it in the schema that you defined in the discover and emit message by message, um, you know, using this yield, uh, um, you know, in this case, what I did was I re read the file and line by line, I am creating an Airbyte message packaged with the, um, you know, with the emitted uh, timestamp. Now this emitted timestamp can be customized. Like for example, you know, you can put, uh, you can read the data. Um, like for example, you know, in some implementations you want to embed uh, when the data is generated, not when it is processed, that, that you could add it here. And uh, that's it. And, you know, nice thing about Airbyte is you can test it local. Like for example, um, CD connectors, source, Noldus, and then I can do Python. And on the code that you produced, uh, that is always uh, Python or uh, do we have a choice? You have a choice of Java, Go, Python, and I think JavaScript as well. Okay. Okay. So you can test locally. Um, so that's a really nice thing to develop. Um, you can dis, you know, you run discover. You can see the schema that you just generated, and then you can. read um, and if you have right accesses in this case i'm purposefully reading only one record let me get let me read 20 it will read 20 records and nice thing about airbyte connectors is if you can implement these three and if they are running on your local you are absolutely guaranteed that it will run in the uh, airbyte infrastructure and once this is done, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so uh, uh, you know, like I'm just I'm just trying to think through. So right now, what we are seeing is that uh, we have got multiple connectors. So I don't I, I don't have to bang my head thinking about you know like this connector needs this kind of connection information, and I've got multiple destinations. So is it fair to say that this is a wrapper over all of those that you know like. Uh, if, if I'm connected to Kafka, it knows that these are the things that I need for that connection. If I'm needing, uh, if I connect to Postgres, it knows that these are the things that, uh, these are the credentials and these are the other parameters that I need for the connection, whether I want to encrypt it or not. And then it pretty much, uh, pretty much just writes code for that, uh, which we otherwise would have maybe as well, but maybe it will be difficult, you know, like doing it for all 300. So I'm just trying to understand, uh, probably the power comes once we start deploying it, is it? So, so because, uh, you know, this is not definitely like Airbyte's greatness that it knows. It is actually developers who developed connectors, just like what you are seeing correct, here. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. If I'm connecting with Kafka, I know to check. I need Kafka topic name, Kafka mm. cluster, cluster address. So, so, so the developers who developed these connectors, have defined this spec, which obtains all the information required for them to uh, make this connector run. I see. What, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Since it is open source, so tomorrow if we are developing it for another connector, we'll write the spec for that. Correct, correct. In this case, like for example, you can see, you know, all these connectors that you saw are right yeah. here. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. See, uh, Oh, there is one source Kafka, right? CD source Kafka. And 
if you look at that code obviously it's uh, implemented in um, Java. Java and I'm sure it will have these three methods yeah, yeah, yeah. here you go check discover and uh, read yeah um, and I think the spec you know the developer has written this spec asking for uh, you know polling time and yeah yeah authentication okay. and all that yeah mm -hmm. um yeah and then um you know this particular connection this particular connection as you can see uh you can sync now or you can actually schedule it i'm just looking settings actually there is there is some api card i can i can show you um but but you can schedule it to run um you know like 5 minutes or 10 minutes or yeah whatever. yeah yeah whatever yeah. one of the challenge is airbyte does not come with sophisticated scheduler it is just like um, linux cron Hmm. it doesn't have like you know um, dagster or uh, airflow kind of intelligent uh, orchestration uh, typically implementations use uh, one of those external tools to manage it uh, so that's uh, something missing in this uh, airbyte i feel eventually somebody will write at least a primitive scheduler uh, but right now it's limited to you know, cron-like uh, scheduling. And once we have this from, uh, uh, how does the deployment happen? Uh, you mean deploying the connector or deploying the airbyte itself? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Uh, well, uh, deploying the deploying the connector with the transformation logic. So I know that we have those uh, files now. Uh, so I'm just curious. Does it make the deployment easy as well? You know, like packaging packaging a Docker container or uh, is that something that is left to us after that? Yeah, and even the code control, right? If somehow we have to change, that, get a new version out of the connector. So, so the dockerization is obviously part of the CI/CD pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The deployment, you have very nice APIs. I think we have few here. Um, like for example, um, I can update source with a different. In this case, um, uh, these these are connection. Let me let me pick definitions. Yeah. So, like for example, uh, once I deploy, I can update. Um, you know, like for example, image tags. Um, uh, in fact, when this connector runs, I can update. Um, the pods it is creating, I can update the CPUs. Pretty much I can update anything on that. Yeah. Okay. And it's an API call. So again, you know, it can be done using CI CD pipelines or uh, if you, if I, I think scheduling is the only thing you want to do using Airflow. I think rest, mm -hmm. uh, you know, these API calls will allow you to do whatever you want to do. Like for example, you know, this one first time, <laughs> And these APIs are also doesn't have any auth if you are using open source, is it? If you are using open source, uh, you are right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, like from my GitLab, GitHub, if I, it's kind of like open for anyone to go and update my connectors. If I'm using open source. If you are using open source, and if you are not implementing uh, something like uh, um, IAP. Yes, you are opening it to potentially anybody updating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's it. Security part is missing. Um, I, I know there is uh, someone is working on it. I hope uh, you know they release it very soon. Um, but I think you know the Airbyte um, as a company, they are interested in make you know leaving some differentiation for them to make money, right? So I, I guess 
they are not interested in releasing an open source uh, authentication yet mm-hmm. and do they have any like, cloud offering or managed service kind of model too right like, if somebody yes. just really wants yes. to buy it okay okay yeah that's good yeah, but it has uh, um like you can you can um, obviously you know cloud and okay, okay. And then, Ram, uh, who who does it compete with? I know that you mentioned Meltano, I believe, over the, over there. Is that is that the other one? Uh, or... The Five Tran is the most dominant one. Five Tran is it? Okay. Uh, it's a commercial product. Data yeah, pipelines. Okay. Uh, most reliable data pipelines. Yeah, yeah, they have their own conference, and um, obviously, enterprises like. uh five crown because you know they get the support and you know they also for money yeah i'm asking so 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 from a reliability perspective uh do we get alerting monitoring uh, you know like when they say that the pipelines are going the most reliable what does it mean and i'm sure airbyte uh, hosted would also say similar things but does it mean that uh, uh as soon as there is a problem in the pipeline we know you know like uh, we we can observe the pipelines um i haven't used fivetran but uh, you are absolutely right i mean you know every um like for example right um if i i can put my slack you are fails okay yeah 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 any time it then fails i get a, you know immediate message on top of it i can implement uh prometheus and you know uh i can collect a whole bunch of uh, metrics um in case of uh, second wave uh, uh we tried prometheus i think it's an overkill uh, because oh. you know airbyte infrastructure is relatively you know you don't have to debug airbyte infrastructure right you want to yeah, yeah, yeah. actors so the, the the simplest simplest way to do that is just uh, google has something called structured logging um you know that was uh, just more than enough any time there is an issue in data we can send yeah. an alert and that's good enough what do, what do we have in metrics so over there there was a metrics sub tab yeah um i think it anonymized is anonymized yeah, usage data collection oh okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah okay yeah. okay but but there is a open source uh, just this tiny module that you can implement and it will give you whole bunch of metrics in uh, uh you know grafana and whatever prometheus uh, yeah, yeah. issue you have okay 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 so this is something that you will recommend for us building pipelines in any engagement is it um definitely yes because because i think you know when companies are writing the code to let's say heb right like we are reading from s3 or gcs or teradata or but wherever i think it's a nice way to segregate data acquisition code um and pre processing code as part of uh, airbyte and then implement some kind of dbt to do your uh, you know domain specific pre processing into your own domain uh, data lake um and then i think i didn't address the bi uh, but looker also implements exactly the same kind of uh thing that i just talked about you know this uh, in looker unfortunately that is written in uh, their own looker ml so it's a pain to learn their dsl but end of the day you know you can implement whole bunch of uh, sqls in looker ml and build yeah. models uh so you can see the end to end right like data acquisition related transformations happen in airbyte pre processing related uh, uh transformations happen in dbt for that particular domain and then bi related transformations and models 
get stored in Looker and obviously Git, but uh, get implemented in Looker. So you are nicely segregating and debugging becomes much easier. Mm -hmm. you, you know where you screwed up. Uh, is it in a position? Is it in pre-processing? Is it in, uh, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, looker? So, a lot of times in these implementations, the biggest problem, I think it's 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 uh, common across most enterprises. And you are looking at the BI report, you don't know whether it is accurate. Uh, and sometimes business analysts point out, oh, in data, this is what it is. And here you are showing it as this. Yeah. So, uh, so it's a pain to compare your application data to your what you are showing in the report. Um, unless you segregate this nicely and you, you can check where the data has gone bad. Yeah. 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 And I know we did not talk about that and I'm being conscious of the time as well, but uh, I'm, I'm assuming uh, we can connect to multiple sources as a part of our load and transform we can marry the data together and then put it push it off to the destination as well so no one source and one destination oh is it okay yeah, yeah okay yeah, yeah yeah okay okay you can you can write your connector to connect with uh, you know two different sources as a custom connector but i think that's a bad practice anyway um i think Connector should do one thing and uh, one thing well. Okay. So what about uh, scenarios where I have to, you know, like uh, get two sources, I need to work on that data and then I have to push it to a destination. How do I do that? Um, I think the better pattern for you, I mean, you, you can uh, bastardize Airbyte and make it do it, but mm -hmm. ideally I would acquire both the data into data lake and okay and do your transformations there. You do your joins in BigQuery or Snowflake or uh, Databricks. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay, that way the data pipelines, they are clean. Uh, so once they land, then you do your other work on that so that you are clear that this is the data came from here, this is the data came from here, and now Correct. I have to do it. Okay, Correct. Okay. okay, I got it, okay. And you know, in DBT, you can nicely segregate like your raw models versus uh, staging models versus silver versus gold so you you can expose and and see how the data transfers from all your sources into destinations i think that's a better place to manage mm. okay. end of the day you may still have to write pipelines i think the goal of modern data stack is to reduce the amount of code you have to do in spark or beam you you may still end up writing some code um like for example airbyte is not streaming right like streaming definitely you need to write your own pipeline uh, so this is only for uh, you know acquiring data from batch workloads okay okay yep you is going to kill us if we keep talking Any other questions? No, I don't think so. I guess uh, Friday I took more than allocated, but uh, thanks for all the questions. And uh, it's just interesting too. Yeah, it's very easy to uh, <coughs> I think learn and manage. I would say. Yeah, yeah. You know.